Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. My name is Mark Johnson, CMO of Bombora. Welcome to what CEOs and their CFOs, CROs, CMOs, and probably other Cs need to know about account based marketing. Thanks for joining us. I am going to make some introductions. Uh, rather than talk about their titles, these should be properly described as legends of B2B. Um, we've got Kathy Maki from Inverta and Craig Rosenberg from uh, Topo, now Gartner. Um, they, they really need no introduction. Um, and myself, I'll be taking notes mostly um, through this process and uh, just excited, um, excited for a webinar, not something that you hear all the time after two years into the pandemic. So thank you all for joining and thank Kathy and Craig in advance um, for being here. So without further ado, we're gonna get going a few housekeeping notes. Um, this next hour is a lot of great content. We probably won't have a lot of time to do Q&A, but please do ask questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring that, capturing them to follow up um, either directly or later in the materials that get sent to you. Um, so let's get right into it. First off, um, we're talking about interacting and explaining ABM to the C-level. Um, C-levels need to know a lot, but they need to know why. So let's start off, Kathy, you got us going like, why ABM? Yeah, and they, I've been doing ABM a long time. And typically, a program will get started because there's a business problem. And it usually fall into one of these four categories. And the first one I hear a lot about is untapped opportunity. If you think back in the day, any tech companies going through this, think of HP in particular. They did great when they were selling to IT. Some of the cloud came up, business units fine. And they didn't know anyone in the business units. And so suddenly there was an untapped opportunity, they didn't know folks. ABM was a great way to help sales tap into that new market for them. Sales slowing, uh, probably again, hardware companies, I could bring up Unisys, sales year over year starting to slow. You can't just add more sales reps at this point to make up the difference. So again, ABM is a great company-wide strategic program to try to stem that, start to get the uptick again. Wallet share declining. Um, Microsoft, when Google started competing in their long dominant office space. And it's like, how do you defend the base? Again, ABM is a great solution. And strategic growth comes up a lot. I think of IBM, when a lot of the tech companies were getting in their space, it's like you have lighthouse accounts or accounts that would look really bad if you suddenly lost them to a competitor. And so you're really looking for those accounts to make sure you keep your name in the industry. And across all these problems, it's usually one of those four problems, and ABM is a great way to, to try to address it for sales. You know what I was going to say, Kathy? Number one is mm -hmm. I've known you for so long and never done a webinar with you, and I should have told Mark that as the kickoff. Like, this is like an incredible moment. But number two is I loved this slide when you brought it up, and I love the way you talk about it, because I would say something a little different, which is account-based works when you tie it to these big problems and you know remember when everyone was like to uh and this is you and i remember like you and i would be at a dinner and people is this a fad and i'd say yeah it will be if you think of it as a cute little toy you know or some cute way to do campaigns this is strategic and it's amazing the business problems you can solve so i i just wanted to throw that in there i just love this slide and um how you're thinking about it because i think it's really important and, you know, I, I would just add a couple things, right, which is we we have some really specific issues um, that regarding demand, right? And, or you could just say in, in being able to engage with customers as well, right? It's just, I mean, it was hard before the pandemic. It's not like it's easier today. But when we talk to um, you know, organizations in particular, like I'm doing a lot of work with CSOs, CROs. Um, you know, the C's that we're talking about today. It's like pipeline and demand gen, that's the top challenge. So we're tying to these business, big business um, goals that we're trying to, to, to hit. And like one of those things that we need to move to get there is pipeline and demand gen. Now I will mention account-based is more than just pipeline and demand gen. Um, but, you know, as we think about like a common use case and one of the things that we want to be able to go do, uh, pipeline and demand gen is clearly one of them. And one of the things that makes it even harder, right? So we know it's number, it's the top, 
right? It's the biggest thing happening for many of these folks is we got to solve that. So one is we're just in an increasingly digital uh, buying experience. And like we knew that before, it just keeps getting more and more obvious to us, especially as we have a whole new slew of digital first um, employees entering the workforce. So we have to be able to think about um, how we generate demand and how we communicate to customers differently. And the result for many, this has been really interesting, is talking to sales leaders, sales reps, and marketing folks. This data comes from sales reps, but I'm talking about everyone sort of that's focused on the customer. We have this challenge of not just reaching the fact that we need to reach one person, but like seven out of 10 are talking about, you know, this, this stakeholder map that continues to grow and is even more dispersed now, right? So they're, they're not in the same office even. Um, and they're engaging differently than ever before. And, you know, being able to communicate, engage with, generate demand, bring these folks together, frankly, it's harder than ever. So we, you know, in my opinion, the thing about account based is why wouldn't you, you need a different way. We're going to talk about how we go do this, but like, we know we want to solve these big business, uh, these big strategic business objectives. And a lot of the things that we traditionally look to to get there are harder than they've ever been before, right? And then we've got this thing called account base, which, you know, I made the joke earlier about people saying, well, is this a fad? And I said, you know, I wish I took money back then on that, the fact that it was not, especially for companies that did do what Kathy was talking about originally, which is tying it to these big strategic rocks that you need to push. Um, because, you know, we're, we're seeing lift here, right? And so when we look at data, there was a lot of actually really positive data points, but six out of 10 saw significant pipeline lift. But here's the thing that I like. It's not any pipeline, it's better pipeline. So when you when you take a pipeline number and you say, look, you know, we got pipeline lift, but that pipeline has a 3x better opportunity to win rate. That's the kind of stuff that really moves the needle for you. So if you take these applications we talked about before, I need to get into a new market. I need to, you know, uh, launch a new product. I need to, you know, save a particular uh, part of my business. Right. One of these. This is one of those strategies that we can apply there and it's proven to have worked. And we'll talk about how we make it work. Uh, today in this presentation, and I'm looking forward to it. So there, there are probably a lot of CMOs and folks on the call who are wishing that it, this was just a marketing thing, but at the same time realize it's not just a marketing thing, ABM that is, um, and that they, like everyone in organization, have to deal with the CEO and the entire C-suite. Um, and so the idea that uh, ABM can be a forcing function um, for clarity of strategy at the CEO's level um, seems to be something that's, that we're going to talk about. And then what about the rest of, of the C-suite? Greg, you want to do the CRO and I'll pick up from there? Yeah, absolutely. I mentioned it earlier and I'm going to mention it 20 times. For the last year, I've been talking to CROs and CSOs, right? And, you know, I spent my whole time having a diversity of inputs, CMOs, et cetera. But like my main person is the CRO. And you know, the most amazing thing is everyone told me, hey, Craig, like CROs, they don't care about ABM. And uh, you know what? They were right. They don't. Because we're going in there going, hey, do you want to do ABM? Right, but we missed the point, right? They, they're they very targeted. They understand that they have better, there's better accounts than others that they need to go after, whether it's for pipeline or for driving better business. So, you know, it's funny. Once, you exp once we explain what we're talking about here, they're in. And then we have to talk about some of the things that they need to do, because it's not as easy. Like if we talk about, well, it's not just marketing. Well, then it's not as easy as saying, well, go get me some leads, right? Uh, the CRO needs to set up their processes, their selling processes, um, how you know messaging, um, handoffs, uh, the uh, the uh, activity behavior actually is a really interesting issue. Like if you take SDRs and sales, as we sort of coordinate touches, um, compensation and like making sure that the right behaviors are supporting the effort. You know, these are the things that come along with it. It's really important that you sell them on the big picture. And then once you do, you'll realize they're in. And then we could, you know, we have um, we have a level of support in here that goes across a lot of the things that the CROs do. But 
But that's what I'd say about the CRO. I don't know, Kathy, you want to talk about the rest of the C's as we call them today? Yeah. And the other thing I'll just add, Craig, because we have had a lot of conversations. I think the CRO, when you first bring up ABM, they hear the M in marketing. That's a marketing thing. Sure, you're going to do more for my accounts. It's like, yeah, who doesn't want more for my accounts? So I think it's a couple things I, I talk to CMOs about is you've got to get general, like a philosophical alignment with them. Like, what does this really mean? Do you believe in marketing that can really make a difference? You know, just do you have a belief in this account-based approach? The next one's more around, like I call operational alignment. Do we have a target account list? Like, what's this hypothesis that we're going to do different for this subset of accounts? And making sure, and is there some meeting cadence, planning cadence that you're doing for marketing? Like, it's not just, I think of the old days with MQL. Like, that was like an alignment. Here, you're going to do this. This is more of a collaboration. And then having some shared metrics and goals. And I think that's what the CRO that's the change when I have CMOs work on CROs. It's a different relationship. Yeah. And the other thing I'll talk to, yeah, anything to add to that? No, I love it. I was, I was going to, if you're thing, online, I'd say plus one or plus five. That was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. The other thing I talk to CMOs about is some of the more successful programs we've had, we've got the CFO involved. And everyone sort of says like, well, they're always just, they do the, you know, the pipeline and they're like, here's how many leads we want. They're used to all that. And I'm like, CFO, they know the numbers. They know where they get the revenue. They can tell you what customers are most profitable. They can tell you which ones are this potential growth. When I had a CFO involved, they suddenly see the impact of, oh, you mean we could take this subset where I think I could have another 30, you know, $5 million accounts. They're only at two. If we did cross all of these. We sold them one or two more solutions. What we do to revenue. So CFO, if you can present this in the right way and get them to buy in, they're a huge advocate of it. And you'll get the money then to fund that program. They're like, oh, that's a no-brainer. That's a win-win, yeah. Yeah. And then the CMO, I'll tell you, the, the programs typically started marketing. I mean, the marketing, you know, CMO decides to do it. But also have seen they're the first ones to kill a program also. And I look now, and it's happened in a number of places, and I look at the profile of CMOs now. And Craig, you lived, lived through this. You had CMOs that have grown up when marketing automation first came in, and that was a volume velocity funnel game. And that's how they became so successful. I mean, that's why they're CMOs now. They did that. They built a relationship with sales. They know those numbers. They know how, how much you have to put in the top of the funnel to hit those revenue and pipeline numbers. But now suddenly, you have an ABM program and it's like, you have an ABM market says, yeah, I got six CIOs to a round table. And I'm like, six? Like, I just did a round table. I had 75 people at it. Or, you know, they do a webinar that has a dozen people, and the other one had thousands. And I think they just, I think, like a zebra, I think it's hard for a zebra to change its stripes. You've been successful doing one thing, and now suddenly it's changed, and it's a quality, not a quantity game. And some of them, I, I've had these conversations where they say, I see that, but I'm spending all this money and I'm only getting like six people there. Like when I can spend less money and get a thousand people. And some of them, I think it's hard to take that mental leap. It's just really hard. Yeah. Craig, I mean, I don't know what you've seen with, you know, well, you work with a different set of CMOs. Yeah, but I mean, look, they, if you think about um, the CMO, you had years of no scoreboards. You had to literally go up and say, hey, you see this amazing ad I did? Love it, right? It's great. Here's why it's great. Then we got a scoreboard. That was great. So like, you know, the CMO gets addicted to the lead scorecard. Uh, you know, I it's it, you said it. It's just hard to pull them off that because, you know, if you didn't have one before and then you were actually now able to go to a board meeting and show a score like a quantifiable way to look at your job and it had big numbers. I mean, if you look at, you know, some of the volume-based demand programs, the numbers were huge. Uh, that, that it is hard, right? And that it makes the, you know, they become a block. That is absolutely true. They become a blocker um, in this process. And, um, you know, look, I've also seen plenty of recovering CMOs who, you know, who bombed a, a process before, but then, their next company, it was just so patently obvious that they had to sell to a certain type of account that they finally came over. But it did take a, it did take a loss or two, a couple lumps to get there. I'm going to interject. Um, 
because we're going to get into this, not to give it away, but the um, mind shift, and I have this discussion with some of my peers uh, about those metrics, but the higher level, what is the more effective value delivery approach? Um, and I think underlying what this, what we're talking about here is how do we deliver value? And oftentimes when you're caught up in, in um, some of the, uh, the measures of the activity, the bigger goal of that value delivery gets lost. Well said. Yeah. And Mark, the only thing I'll add in the slide is, you know, if you can get the C-suite aligned, the only thing then you need to be aware of is what do the teams touch the customers? So I look at, is there a professional services team, customer support team, customer success? And the other part that's really big is you've got an operations and systems that are set up for leads. And now you're going to an account-based model. It's not the volume. It's making sure your, your revenue ops, your marketing ops, sales ops, whatever you want to call it, really has the resources and the tools to really sh to show the value of an ABM program because they're not set up to do that right now. Yeah, I, by the way, Mark, I was wondering on your experience on the CFO being a part of this and sort of Kathy was talking about how important they are to the process. And I don't know, I was wondering, you know, as a CMO, what, you know, what, what, what's your take on that? And what's your experience has been with that? Yeah, I think ABM or otherwise, um, and what I've seen personally and, and hear from my peers is it's always the better, better relationship you have um, with the CFO, uh, the more productive it winds up being, um, for sure. And so that underpins all this. I think the, Kathy said it earlier, um, there's just the name ABM and it's account-based marketing. And oftentimes that becomes, well, it's this marketing thing over here and we're dealing with um, sales commissions and pipeline, et cetera. And the connection between um, all the activities that deliver value holistically across the go-to-market organization and those pipeline metrics and revenue outcomes is not quite made just yet. And you know that's what we're all here trying to accomplish. Yeah, that's right. Are right, you guys ready to move on? And I mean, this one I'll take. So I'll have people come to us and Craig, I'm sure you've heard the same. Oh, I think I need an ABM program. You know, I, I hear people get great growth with it and it's not for everyone. And what we've, and Mark, if you wanna to move to the next slide, we have to continually look at because every business is different. I have some clients, you know, they sell to maybe a thousand accounts and they can have 10 accounts that are like $20 million accounts for that you want a different marketing motion than you do if you're selling something that's, you know, $49.99 a month on a subscription or fast model. So what I try to tell people is, I get with a CMO, I'm like, and actually from the CFO, where do you expect to get your revenue? Where do you expect to get it now? Where do you expect to get in the future? And then looking at these different motions, you have like on the left-hand side, you may have X amount of inbound demand creation. Like you may think 25% of my revenue is just from stuff that's just coming in the door and I've got SDRs to handle that. Next one may be, hey, I've got some targeted marketing. And a lot of people actually call this ABM. It's like, I've got a list of 3,500 accounts and I'm just gonna market to them. And just to get around waste, I'm just focused on them. That's what the reps are focused on. We're gonna go there. And then you start to look at different ABMs. You'll hear it called one-to-one, one-to-few, one-to-many. Think of the scalable ABM as the one-to-many. Hey, I, I'm looking at retail stores and I'm gonna do everyone that's a retail that is home goods. And you might just focus on that because your messaging is gonna be different. You think of it as the more granular you're gonna get with your messaging, the more personalized it's gonna be. And as you head up that continuum, that's what you end up being. Account centric may be, hey, I'm gonna do retail, home goods, all with a certain business problem. And then you get to one-to-one, -one, which is really more around executive engagement. You know, there are 10 people at the account I really need to know well. And I, you know, like I said, they, they bring in enough money that it is worth having a one-to-one -one program for. But one thing I'll bring up as we talk about this, not every account quote deserves to be an ABM account. If you can hit your number without ABM, why would you put the resources into it? So it's accounts where you need that extra lift. You need more personalization. You need something more targeted. You need, you need something to actually get it to be an ABM account. If you can do it with regular demand gen, not worth all these, the time and effort if that personalization is not going to matter at that focus. I agree. 
That's a great slide. I would say, and by the way, I, I say the same thing to people. I, it's actually, it's not one of my favorite things to say, but I've definitely said it before and it shocks the room where you're like, if you don't need account base, then let's not, let's just do what you're doing. You read about it. You want, you think, well, I got to go do this really cool thing. It's like, now we're going to do it to solve a business problem. And um, if we can't, then let's not do it. Right. And there's another element to it, which I'll talk about when we talk about targeting. But I, you know, anything else you would add to this slide? And then maybe we dive into some specifics. The only thing I'll add on is, like you said, a lot of times people go, well, I want to do ABM. I've heard it's really successful. And my thing is, you know, you said to have that business case. You know, what's the your hypothesis going in? Yeah. And then you can see, like, did that accomplish it or not? And it, it may or may not. I, but. I say move on. You will have lots of good things to say, Craig, and I'm anxious to hear. <laughs> I just, I, I wish we could talk about that particular topic. All our stories about uh, launching ABM, it is critical as we talk about whether it, it's success or failure. Um, you know, there is a, a lot of the things that we're talking about is, is part of that. So I thought we thought what we would do is talk about four uh, key areas here. So one is, I think if we agreed on one thing, account based is targeted, right? And so we want to talk about, you know, how you know the the idea of identifying fit and then using uh, data to continually prioritize. It was funny, by the way. I just can I give a side note. The other day, I was talking to one of the other analysts, and they said, "I'm pretty sure if we just said account based right now is all about the data, uh, we'd be pretty right." And that's true. I mean, there's so the data has also helped advance account base to to where it is today. And it's been amazing. We'll talk about that. Um, and then the second is, uh, you know, orchestration, like, can we, can we bring programs together um, and have different groups in the organization that, uh, that touch the customer work together, right, to drive um, engagement and ultimately conversion at these accounts. We talked about reporting, how do we look at account base differently than others. Here's the hint. We're going to talk about it. you have to look at it differently than the others. That's what we've been we were we were sort of leading you down that path. We'll talk about how you do that number 3 and then finally, you know, how do we use, you know, a chart or how do we bring uh organizations together so we can have that alignment. Okay? So let's dive into it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is this idea of target account selection and prioritization. I tell people this all the time. I'm just going to start with this uh, for the probably, I think it's the third time I've mentioned, I'll mention it again, which is you have to believe that certain accounts are better than others and data will help you get there, right? Um, and then you have to be able to all agree, hey, you know, this is, this is true, right? That's like one of the things that you have to check off the box to be successful at account base. And actually, um, you know, when I look at some of the data that we have at Gartner in terms of when these programs fail and don't work, you know, one is obviously, you know, there's an alignment issue, but the other is sort of agreeing on uh, selection, right? And the, it's a it's a breakdown area. And so let's just talk about it because many organizations have, you know, I would say pre-pandemic started to understand how important it is to think about uh, being very targeted versus broad. Um, and then the pandemic was like this, thing that allowed us to sort of it triggered a lot of different uh target market changes pivots you know these things and th those are the, that's the kind of business change that we talked about in the start that you know account base can help you solve if you know you're going to reevaluate or change your icp or your target market um what are you just going to start and then the leads will start to flow or what are you going to start you're just going to go start closing deals there we have, at that point we have to go consider account base and that's where this stuff all ties together, okay? So we go through this process, we're starting to believe, heck, you know, we gotta make these really good decisions about who the target is, okay? We wanna start big. So you start with <clears throat> your big idea of your TAM or you know, whatever you wanna call it, your big like target market, you gotta go to the investors and say, we can sell to everyone. Um, and then, like I said, we have to believe that they're, accounts that are better than others. And the way we start to think about it from a fit perspective, what kind of accounts is ours is an ideal customer profile, where basically a, a set of attributes define what becomes a list of target accounts. So we take this big world and we make it a little bit smaller. And then what we do is from there, we're going to use data to focus on accounts that are more likely to engage. You know, we just, you know, and I want to dig into that because 
frankly, I love that part as well. Um, I'm going to be totally honest. I love all of it, but like, I just, the fact that we can use data to make better decisions on who, you know, who to go after is one of the most exciting things. So this is actually a prediction from uh, that, you know, one of the teams, the analyst teams at Gartner said by the end of 2022, uh, next year, 70% of B2B marketers will utilize third-party intent data, right? Because it's just the idea here is powerful. And, and we really felt it, you know, I, you know, I work with groups that work from an account-based marketing perspective. And I forget uh, the category that Kathy had the, I think it was targeted outbound. Was that number two on the list? Yeah. yeah. So like they, had, you know, a lot of SDR groups, a lot of just, you know, targeted prospecting. And again, last year was like, you know, last year and a half, there was this change. We had to reevaluate how we did things. You couldn't just, you know, go throw things against the wall, right? So we started to understand how to use data to prioritize. So we had this big window of all these accounts we wanted to go after, or, you know, it could be smaller, but we, we understood like what those accounts were. Now, when, when can we go after? I was my biggest thing. When I started to see this idea of engageability that my team brought back to me, said engageability, we can use data to figure out if they're more likely to engage. I said, oh my gosh, like part of the problems that us pundits did when we helped start account bases, we said, we're going to get really targeted, but we actually didn't make it easier because we just said, and by the way, here's a really hard list to go after. And like, we're going to go, sure, we're going to do marketing, all these things, but like, couldn't that be easier? And the answer is yes, right? So engageability, there's simple stuff you could do, like going after current customers, which many people are doing, uh, or just previously engaged contacts. But like intent data has been um, a really powerful way for organizations to take that prioritization, right? And to take that target account list and to figure out when, and we're using third-party engageability that gives us that visibility that, hey, it's time, like we're more likely to be able to connect with them. If you look at the data I had before, seven out of 10 organizations, right? They're saying, you can't, we can't get to the accounts when we want to. Uh, you know, what is that clue? What is that, that that can tell us that it's time to go? And so as we think about targeting, that is the idea. Big target accounts, right? Brought down to a smaller set of target accounts through ideal customer profile, then brought down to who we're going to go after right away using data, right? Um, based on who we think is more engageable than others. And we're going to use data sources like intent data to go do that. Very powerful. So then what we want to do is if we've made these decisions on who to go after, um, you know, how, right? And I want to give you guys some data on this. This is really interesting, okay? So one is when we think about everything, we're going to bring together multiple channels and multiple functions, okay? So uh, one thing um, might work better than other, and everyone asked me, but nobody disagrees that a lot of, you know, like X, more things work better than others. Like if you took a sales rep, their, their minimum amount of channels they use is three, right? And sales reps are wholly efficient, right? They've figured that out on their own, right? Because it just doesn't work. And we want to be able to do that. We want all the marketing channels that we've had from our demand gen programs at our disposal. We want the stuff that sales development reps at sales are using. We want executives. We want to do this because ultimately what we're trying to do here is if we've determined that it's the right fit, the timing's good, can we throw, frankly, throw the book? And it's a scalable book, don't get me wrong, that we can throw at them. One of the reasons we want to do that is because despite all the things I'm saying and everyone's saying, which is this preference for digital, actually, when they are trying to figure out like how, what to buy, you know, if they're in the consideration purchase, whatever that might be, the digital content, basically, they rank it the same as the sales rep. You know, they, they, we don't have that key indicator that says, you know what, throw everything away and just go with one. Actually, the data tells us don't throw everything away and don't go with just one. Let's go with multiple. Orchestration is an answer to that. The other thing that's really interesting is we were so good at content. I do this in a complimentary way. We all embraced the content marketing um, revolution, let's call it. It's been amazing. We've created really valuable content for our users. But here's the thing is, we've created so much great trustworthy content, it's actually overwhelming. And it's, it's harder. It makes decision-making harder, right? We're in this 
we're one-upping each other on content here and we're creating really good stuff. And actually now it's hard to discern, you know, between, uh, you know, one vendor versus another. And so that tells you, let's go out and let's actually, we can't take that one, there's that one content piece sent that one time through that one channel is not going to increase our odds to get to that account that we believe we should talk to right now. So we're gonna run, right, a, a, a multiple channels, multiple functions. If you look at the top, we have essentially things you guys do today, digital ads, personalization, LinkedIn ads, you know, whatever those things might be, we're gonna create air cover. We're gonna run those across those accounts over the course of, you know, whatever amount of time you determine to be appropriate. We're going to have marketing touches you already do today, marketing emails, you know, direct mails, you know, everyone say, oh, direct mail, it's hot. Sure. But it's not new, right? It's just, and it's just works a lot better in the, in put into a mix of a whole bunch of other things. Um, executive outreach times, not one time, not, hey, could you go reach out to that person? Let's have it as part of a program to go get to these folks. And then the things we use today, email, phone, LinkedIn, video, with the exception of maybe personalization, everything is incredibly doable. All we're doing is we're bringing it all together and we're orchestrating, we're doing it together. So we figured out these, you know, who these accounts are and we're going and running these types of campaigns against these accounts. Now, I want to say something because Kathy has thankfully not reminded me like she normally does that this is not just about pipeline. Um, and that is really important and i i i'm I, i'm just she, i hear her in my head and i do want to say a couple of things on that so one is this is very pipeline centric that said um i want to talk about two things so one is there's the types of touches to reach people there's also um the keeping cross-functional multi-touch through sales processes there's also um, pardon me there's also um you know, running these campaigns against customers and retention in these things, right? And thinking about your cross-functional multi-touch, not just in a pipeline um, type of way, okay? So Kathy, I just want you to know I'm thinking about you and you're thinking about me. I don't know if I satisfied that though, if you have any other comments, <laughs> jump in. Well, and you know, almost, you know, it's not a good webinar unless we have some back and forth. <laughs> the only thing I'd say is at the beginning when you talked about engageability, I agree with that, but I think that's to me for the net new coming in. like. Here are my 3,500 accounts. How do I find the right ones? I think a lot of times when it's more strategic ABM, there's other criteria to look at also about, like you said, what are those accounts you can't afford to lose? Or where is that, that uh, white space? Can I sell them more solutions? So I think it's also for current customers for cross-sell, upsell, and not just net new. I agree. Actually, there's there's multiple. Let's, let, let's talk about that because I love that. So one is, um, yes, I didn't hear you on the, I didn't have you in my head ringing on the, on the talking about engageability. So engageability is actually having that data during the sales process is hugely valuable, by the way. So even though you're engaged and I'm sure uh, Mark and team have lots of examples of this, right? Where the sales reps in a deal and we're getting data from, you know, uh, through the third party internet from wherever saying, you know, they're still out there looking at this. They could be looking at competitors, whatever that might be hugely valuable also uh you know tells you a lot of you know what's happening there's just a lot of power in this data um in the sales process you're right a lot of power in this data against cross sell upsell there's a when against customers as well there's a i i, I agree the engageability and thinking about that across multiple use cases not just pipeline is really powerful but actually i was doing the lead and so i was gonna say well look we're gonna run all these touches um, et cetera, against, you know, different types of use cases in the account-based uh, world. But also one of the key things that I like across all the different use cases is this idea of a high value offer. And if you remember what I said earlier, I'm, you know, I'm doing a ton of work with CROs. We have this engagement problem and part of the problem is self-inflicted, right? Which is the first thing we always want to do is we always want to talk about our product and, or we want to show it. And, that's not always the best way to drive engagement. So what we want to think about here is what we call a high value offer. For the sake of this, we're calling it a sales meeting. Uh, there are other examples. It could be just content. It can be a uh, field marketing effort. You know, what is that high value offer? It's, it's, it's an offer that's so unique and timely that it compels a prospect to engage. And I want to talk about this because this is one 
where uh, I use this to solve a multitude, just the idea of the high value offers, particularly for sales, um, uh, multiple to use cases here on and using this idea, right, to help us drive engagement. So if you think about what I was describing before, and we have all we we have all of these touches that we want to go run, I could tell you your orchestration plan, despite all the touches, despite, you know, your ad spend, despite the SDR activity can often be ruined if you pay it off with and hey, let's go get a cup of coffee. I can show you the product and see if I can't help you, right? Like, well, <laughs> it's just, uh, it's really, I mean, people come to me, I remember early on, they said, well, we're doing all this stuff and it doesn't work. Well, yeah, because at the end, you're like doing the same thing, right? Let's, can we jump on for five minutes so I can do a discovery call? What we want to do is actually tie the entire program to this idea of a high value offer, this meeting, this, or this, this event, or this, you know, something so compelling that they have to say yes. Like what I tell people is, can you give something that's a hundred percent for them? And, you know, there's many a different ways to think about that, but like, that's hard for people. And they're all, you know, and it's like, inevitably when we're meeting on this, everyone's trying to think about their angle. Just, just forget your angle for a minute and think, what is it that they most want to go talk about? So I'll give you some examples. Market trends, data and vision works like a champ, okay? Across, I've seen it work across multiple verticals. You're changing the offer to meet from something for you, right? To something for, that's their job. That's something that they have to go do. So the latest trends in dot, dot, dot is a very simple way to think about that, right? I would also say one of the things our sales um, analysts are spending a lot of time with customers on is collaborative planning. And you could do this now with these virtual whiteboards. It's amazing. But like, you know, this offer where you can get on and talk through these business objectives that the cus your potential customer is having and actually translating that into some kind of strategic, valuable uh, piece of content for them or some valuable, you know, strategic idea for them. Uh, that's the collaborative planning play that often happens second. It's not quite as powerful in like an opening um, program. It's really good to offer in the sales process. It's really good to offer um, to customers, right? Um, and uh, it's, an, it's just another thing that sort of pays you off from an account-based perspective. I mentioned customized experiences, not necessarily meetings, but, you know, putting customers in their own content. You know, I have a if you can publicly capture data or um, like many of the security companies can do this where they'll actually create reports, et cetera, that have, you know, customer data, that's a hugely valuable um, offer to them about whether they're secure or not and, and, and those types of things. So that's the idea here. We wanna be able to actually move from, you know, doing campaigns, doing programs, doing frankly, you know, even just communicating with our potential customers and not offering, well, you know, this, this high value offer, it is so powerful. You know, I have customers where the high value offer is now their sales step. They don't even play around. They don't do anything different there. So I don't know what you think of that, Kathy. Um, do I have a pretty good idea there? Anything you've seen? Totally. I mean, this is, it's funny with ABM programs, but then they go to their product. It's like you just negated everything we just did up to now. And I've had really good luck. You're right. It's not the first offer, but the collaborative planning. When you are on with a customer and they're sharing, sharing confidential information, like <sighs> you just won. Like that's yeah. what you want. Cause that's later how you can position where your solution is. All these, if I could get customers and clients to do these four or some combination, like yeah. that's just, it's ideal. It's totally ideal. And that's where <laughs> they drop the ball. They get the meeting and then want to talk about their product. <laughs> I, know, I know. I'm sure Mark gets five, low value offers a day, maybe more in his email inbox. So uh, probably, probably 50. And when I see this, it, it speaks to the show. Don't tell help. Don't sell adage, yeah. which is yeah. in a nutshell. You know, it's incredible too. I just love the tie in on the account based program, right? Where you can actually work backwards from the high value offer and create a really valuable program that ties back to it. It's just, it's just great. All right. So let's talk about reporting. Um, model adjustments here, guys. Uh, you heard it from actually all of us here in the start of this. Mark even had, had to make sure, like, guys, we have to think about this differently. And so let's talk about this. And, you know, we'll all jump in here. This is really important. Um, and, um, and as you make this transformation, 
we know we have to measure it. Okay. So that, you know, when we at Gartner look at kind of what's happening from a challenges perspective and account base, you can see that it comes down to measurement and proving ROI, right? So, you know, how do we measure this uh, effectively and prove what we're, you know, trying to go do? But, you know, frankly, everything's about data that we're talking about. So we've got the measurement side and then we've got, you know, the other two is like more data about the accounts context. This is what we we're talking about from an engageability uh, perspective and account selection, right? So everything's about the data. We're going to focus in this section on what you see in the orange one and four, right? How do we go right, and be able to credibly um, talk about account base, but not just like the credibility for the rest of the organization. Frankly, there's, when we measure it wrong, we often put the program at risk. And so we, we'll, we'll talk about that um, through this next section. I'm gonna hand this to Kathy for the next couple of slides and then uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, what I like to look at when we talk about ABM programs, what I call the three R's. And if you position this with your account executives, they get it because they naturally do this in a sales cycle. They don't immediately say, do you want, well, hopefully they don't, do you want to buy this? They know one, the company they work for, they have to have a good reputation. Like there's got to be a brand there. They're not even going to look at your content or have a call, call with you. The next is then you have to build those relationships and both of those will lead to revenue. So when I look at your ABM programs, there's got to be some activities that deal with either improving, a lot of times I get, we wanna change the perception. They see us as a point provider. I wanna be seen as a strategic partner or there's something I used to do this. I wanna be positioned as this. So a lot of times it's changing perception or just ed educating them. We have all these solutions. You just have this one. That's sort of the first one. The second one is really getting, I just call, you've gotta start developing, keep stronger relationships with a lot of those key stakeholders. And there's a lot of activities around that. And then the last one is just this revenue. I mean, that's just, is it opportunity? Is it win rate? Is it, you know, whatever that is. But the three R's, and I like to report out on them. Like how, and a lot of the reputation and relationships can be those leading indicators to how you'll get to revenue. Because they're going to keep saying, the Airbnb Pro, do I have money yet? Is there opportunity? And it's like, well, we now know who the key stakeholders are, and you can start to walk them through short, medium, and long-term metrics. So I think it's a great way to tip the conversation. I love. I, I, why have I not heard you talk about this? I think this is great. I was thinking too on the reputation side. Is that um, when did you guys start to develop? I love that one. Right, I hadn't even thought of that, and uh, I just think it's very really well brand. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I use it with net new because a lot of times it's like they don't know who you are. And for current customers, you've heard this, Craig, as much as I have, they don't know our full portfolio or they don't view us as a strategic yeah. partner. It's a perfect place for ABM to come in. Yeah, I love it. I think that's great. You wanna talk about the dashboard? The other thing I look, yeah. Well, the one thing I look at in the dashboard is I've seen them where there's like 20 metrics. It's like, there's email, five. Like five or less, you know, like just keep it clear. And this, again, your engagement's on here, but I like to look at coverage. I can't tell you how many ABM pros we start with and like, oh, here are the 20 accounts you want to focus on. And then they don't know anyone there. Like a first one should be, who, you know, who are these folks that you're going after? Just like, how well are you doing on that? Especially like when I work initially with HP, it's like, we don't know anyone in the business unit. Well, step one. Yeah. And then just... Are they aware? Do they know who you are? Have they ever heard of you? Have they ever opened an email? Have they ever come to one of your events? And then Craig, to your point, the engageability is so important and however you want to define that. But those three are in service of like program impact and influence. I look at those around program impact. Like if you have a, you know, 20 people at your webinar, is it the right 20 people? Are they the right C, you know, C level or the right account? But you should always be comparing your ABM program to your regular demand gen efforts. Because if it's not getting you a higher win rate, you know, higher dollar value, you know, there's got to be something we have to sell more solutions in. Again, there's no point of having an ABM program. You don't need all that extra effort if it's not going to really pay off in some way. I mean, Craig, what do you look at around, you know, metrics for this? Well, I mean, look, I, I actually... Um... I'm going to talk a little bit about like the progression funnel, but I want to, before I go, mm -hmm. I want to comment on a couple of these things is I laughed on coverage. If you want the connection with the CRO and the sales leader, they understand coverage. 
right? I mean, it drives them nuts. I love that one. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the ABM and whether it's affecting a, a sort of strategic business metric, that one for me is uh, another part of this, like, can we solve for um, real business problems? Like, for example, if you want to increase deal size, um, you should be able to look at the accounts that are more likely to buy more and focus on them, right? Like the, there's a lot of self-fulfilling prophecy, if you think about this right, as you're thinking about your account-based program, that we want to make sure we want to prove out, obviously, because what you said is true, which is, hey, look, account-based, if you can do this on, with your regular flow and change particular uh, metrics like deal, you know, deal size is one that I always, it's, you know, someone comes to me and says, we want to, you know, get bigger deal sizes. I, you know, we look at it and we say, well, there's certain accounts that are going to drive those better than others. Then, you know, let's, if you do account base, you're likely going to be able to increase LTV, increase, you know, whatever those things are. And so I love, you know, that that's really important for us to remember as we think about, we don't, you know, we may not move the needle on everything, but if we're thinking up front, right, and, and talking about what, what kind of business challenges we want to go cover, we should track that. And as you said, we should look at it um, against our other programs to see if the level of effort actually matches what we're achieving, if anything, in, the, you know, with the account-based programs. So I just want to talk about what we have been doing, which is uh, we actually do talk a lot about what Kathy just talked about, which I, you know, I'm in favor of everything you just said. I, you know, what, what we wanted to do um, with account base was, can we have a progression type of funnel similar to what, you know, many people uh, built their volume demand business on, you know, the MQL and the SQL, the SAL. And so what we, what we learned was we can, and actually it's a pretty simple funnel. All right. So I just want to walk you guys through it because it's actually, I don't know, it's one of my favorite things, frankly, to talk about. Um, I, there's everything here gets me really excited, but like being able to unlock metrics has been um, really great for account based and be great for my customers. So one is, you know, what's interesting about account based, it's the funnel is fixed at the top off, you know, like you are going to figure out what, you know, what your, what is your, you know, what is the number of target accounts that you're going to go after? So we actually started, you know, with that at the top. And then what that means is the way we affect the metrics down the funnel is through different optimizations we do in execution, right? Because in a volume program, sometimes, shoot, if you want to affect the numbers, you just add more to the top. You don't really do that in account base, right? The second thing we want to talk about is engagement. So we want to take the target accounts. We want to drive engagement, not just leads, Right. We want to create a threshold for meaningful engagement of things that, you know, they might engage with. And look, there's plenty of we talked about reputation. If you have no reputation, you're going to take any engagement. If you have a pretty solid uh, reputation, you're probably going to want more. Right. You many people want to do a combo, too, of like intent, engagement, uh, like on your website, maybe, you know, uh, you know, me going to a booth, whatever those factors might be. If we want to look at that, like, can we take these target accounts um, and get them engaged with us? We like in the middle of the funnel, the SDRQL, we decided to call it that because um, we needed this thing that distinguished the sales development motion um, to the sales motion. Um, you know, the SDRs have been invaluable to account base. So we want to just meetings. And by the way, new programs, I think you should just start on, can you increase meetings at target accounts? It's a very simple way to look at the success of your program. Uh, you know, for me, it's for most of you, it's kind of, it's this, it's this really important moment and we we're tracking it. We we're sort of throwing it into everything um, else. And we shouldn't, we should pull it aside and say, look, like the SDRs are going to, you know, we're going to pretty much push the data and the programs through the SDRs and, um, you know, how many meetings are we creating there? And if they're sales, fine, but, call, you know, just call them what they are. We're going to create meetings. Um, and then, you know, opportunity creation, that's everything. We, we believe in what's known as opportunity rate, right? Can, from the uh, number of target accounts, how many opportunities can we create? And then obviously close one's the ultimate goal, but it takes time, which is why you have progression metrics. The other thing that we think is really important, which I mentioned and actually Kathy mentioned early, which is earlier, which is uh, we came up with this idea called the double funnel. Now we have the triple funnel because of product led. And now we have 
a quad, quad funnel because of channel. Um, but we felt like people were holding back on account-based or failing at account-based because they felt like it was all or none on how you track things, right? Like it, it was, well, how am I supposed to track it? Um, okay. And then we said, well, how about this funnel? I said, well, I also have this one. It's like, okay, here's the deal. Come just sit down. I want to talk to you. You can have both, right? You're going to have your volume programs track it. You're going to have your account-based programs track that and you can track it side by side and look at it together. Um, and now, like I said, we have product led ultimately what we believe is the top of the fun, like these initial steps, those are different. But like it's going to come back down to either SDR qualified leads or opportunities. So you can meet somewhere at the end of the funnel, which makes this idea of a double funnel, triple funnel even more powerful. So I'm going to say one thing, which is I love cross-functional alignment. Kathy, you want to take it from here and start talking about how we go make this happen? Absolutely. So there's two things that I think, if you can just move it ahead of slide, that I think is really important. And this takes up the bulk of when I kick off an ABM program is we make everyone do a charter and the target account selection. So those two things is first thing is like, what's the opportunity? Like, why are we doing this? Why are we going to put, what do you expect to get out of this? And then what's the long-term vision? Like right now, we just want to get more at bat. Long-term, we want to be a strategic partner. Going through what are the goals for the program? Account selection. I tell people, if you don't spend the bulkier time here, you're going to be in trouble. And then what are the metrics? And all this does is get on one page to drive alignment across all the groups. Because if you don't, I guarantee three months into it, someone will say, oh, no, I want to have this account in the program. Oh, no, I thought we were really driving this objective. You've got to get it on one page. And that is one of the key things. And like I said, getting the right account in there and having agreement about that target account list, those two things will make your program successful. Just getting alignment on those two things. I love it. How long does it normally take you to get everyone aligned on the charter? It's really funny. If I have a project and I say, here's 100% of all the things you get a play launched, I tell them 60 to 80% of the time is going to go up in the front front floor. That's how much time I make and put in it. Uh, and then the rest of it is marketing. You know, you can just do it. What's your messaging? Let's get it. Doing this is hard. And you don't think it is until you try. And then you this, everyone weighs in. Oh, no, no, that's not what I thought we we're doing. It should be these accounts. I love it. It's a huge difference. It's Make so a huge great. Difference. So great. So now um, we're closing up, we're running up on time here. This is amazing. Alignment in the C-suite doesn't always go hand in hand. So we've got a few common mistakes and hurdles up on the screen as we close this out. Um, Craig, Kathy, you guys wanna pull one or two of these out or just make a closing comment um, before we wrap it up for this amazing session. Number four, I like bullet number four. Focusing on a one thing instead of everything that we did. It's an obsession. I agree with that. Number four. All right. I'm going to go with number one. A lot <laughs> of times marketing says, well, I can't get sales aligned, so I'm just going to do it. It's going to be so great. Then they're going to get on board. No, doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Fantastic. I'm going to go with all of them. Um, I want to say this is the first webinar I've been taking notes instead of referring to notes. Um, so Kathy, Craig, thank you very much. I, I'm sure the audience um, felt the same. And we want to thank you for participating. Um, thank everybody for attending. And, uh, you look for this information. Everything will be sent out to all the participants. And uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you, Mark. And Craig, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. So thanks. I uh, um, really enjoyed I'm, this session with you. Yeah, as always, as always. Right. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you in Austin next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.